Well, it's good to see you this evening, and it's been a wonderfully blessed day for me to be here with you and to see your faces, talk to many of you, and to the privilege of preaching God's Word this day on such a wonderful subject, the life of our Lord in His youth in Nazareth. And uh, as, a, as a preacher, as a pastor, I enjoy some of my own sermons more than others. <laughs> Uh, some of them I wish I hadn't gotten into, but um, this is a subject which you cannot help but love and enjoy in the delivery. <clears throat> so I ask you to turn once again then to the passage that we studied this morning, which is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And we come again to the section dealing with the youth of Jesus, which begins at verse 39 and goes down to verse 52. And it incorporates, with a very large gap there of 12 years, it incorporates this one event that we have, it's the only one, from his youth. The apocryphal books tell of stories of Jesus making clay birds and sending them off into the air and breathing on them and them coming alive and all the rest, which is just apocryphal stories that people made up. But the only one that we do have from his youth is the incident when he was 12 years of age and went up to the temple and uh, although it's only one event that we have, there's a lot there for us. And I decided last night that I would not be able to deal with that today in just the two sermons. So on your outline sheet, we will not be looking at letter C, which is uh, his life in the Father's house. That would be a separate study someday. But I just felt that it would be a, a spiritual overload uh, to include that, so I've taken it out. Although we will touch on that incident at a few points this evening for the, uh, the earlier point that we're looking at, his development. So we will touch on some of it, but we won't look at it, all of it. So let me read then the section, starting at verse 39, down to the end. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then, after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been, have been anxiously looking for, for you. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Lord, once again, this is your word. It is spirit and life. It has been breathed out from you and it is your word. It's what you speak, it's what you have written for us. And we come and we realize that it is only with the illumination of your Holy Spirit that we can understand it properly, and apply it carefully. So please help us to do that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this morning we were talking 
essentially about this name, Jesus the Nazarene. And when we think about this as his name and all that he stands for, we realize that this name takes us back to the place where he grew up. And as I started in this morning message, where you grew up in your life is a big part of your life. It's a big part of who you are. And so it is with the Lord Jesus. He is Jesus the Nazarene because Nazareth was his home. And all of the features and characteristics of Nazareth in the first century, which many of which are probably still true today in terms of the topography of that part of Palestine, naturally, the land is pretty much the same, influenced his life. Nazareth was his home. Tonight we'll be looking at his home life and his family, which goes with this, but this morning we talked about how Nazareth and Galilee and the land and the city and the town, however you want to call it, influenced his life. And so when we say we believe and follow Jesus the Nazarene, it includes all of this formative influence which our Lord had in his life. We also stated that Nazareth was his school. It is the place where he learned. People will always ask you when they want to know a little bit more about you, where did you go to school? And so Nazareth was his home and it was his school. It's where he learned. And so tonight when we speak about his development, it is uh, intricately related to that as well. It was also the launching pad for his ministry, which takes us into the Gospels as you go forward in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, chapter 4, or Matthew chapter 4, where you, you see him leaving Nazareth and going to Capernaum. We read that this morning in chapter 4 of the Gospel of Matthew. So he is Jesus the Nazarene because Nazareth was his home. Nazareth was his school. Nazareth was the launching pad for his ministry. God prepared him to be who he was as the divine son of God and son of man through those 30 years in Nazareth. So we talked about life and the return to Nazareth, living in Galilee, settling in Nazareth. And now we come then to letter B, which is life in Nazareth, where we will talk about two points his parents, and his development. So let's think about life, his life in Nazareth. And by talking about his parents, and we know a lot about Mary, and we can assume many things about Joseph uh, based on the Matthew account, and as you know, we we believe, scholars believe that uh, Joseph died at some point. Mary was a was alone and because he's not mentioned in the Gospels after the birth accounts. But we do learn from this incident when he was 12 years old, these things about his parents and you'll see the points there in your outline. First of all, they were pious. They were pious. We'll talk about this point. They had good and happy times together. The second point, we'll talk about the tension in the relationship that developed and then the normal relationship that they had and then the explanation of this tension. So let's talk about the piety of his parents. Now, piety, or being pious, is not viewed favorably in the world and in ordinary conversation. So if you look at a dictionary definition, you will find that it reads in this way, Webster's Dictionary, having or showing a dutiful spirit of reverence for God or an earnest wish to fulfill religious obligations. So that's the good side of being pious. That's the positive meaning of piety. Let me state it again. Showing a dutiful spirit of reverence or respect for God and an earnest wish, desire, or commitment to fulfill religious obligations. So in that sense, I want to be pious. I want to have piety, and so should you. Now, there's a, another side, you know, dictionary definitions, you know, you'll often, when you read your dictionary, you'll see point one, point two, point three. The words can be used in different ways. We're not talking about this other definition 
of pious, which you will find in the dictionary, which goes like this. Hypocritical concern with virtue or religious devotion. Hypocritical concern with virtue or religious devotion. So we're not talking about that. The word pious is used in that regard. Oh, she's so pious. Oh, he's so pious. Is used in a pejorative sense. So when, when I say that the Lord's parents were pious, I mean that they showed a dutiful spirit of respect or reverence or fear for God and an earnest wish, desire, commitment, or pattern of life to fulfill religious obligations. And that's how Christians should live their lives. It should be pious. Not hypocritical piosity, but pious in this reverential, God-honoring sense. As it says in 1 Samuel, he who honors me, I will honor. That is a, 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 a beautiful principle stated in the book of 1 Samuel with regard to Samuel and his family. But Luke 2, if you notice verse 41, tells us that his parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. There is an illustration of this piety. This was a family custom or commitment for their family. Luke chapter 4 and uh, verse 16 says this. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. There it is. And it's emphasized he had been brought up in a pious home. And this was his custom to enter the synagogue on the Sabbath. In Luke chapter 2, we're seeing it was their custom to take that annual trip to Jerusalem when he began at 12 years of age. But it was a weekly custom as well. Worship at the Nazareth synagogue was a family custom while he was growing up. That's an expression of piety, being pious. As Christian parents, or even for ourselves, as Christian men and women, our piety is seen in many ways, one of which is our regular attendance on the worship of God. We want to honor God publicly with his people. And you know, the Psalm says that God looks out from heaven. I believe it's Psalm 133, or Psalm 33. And he looks out from heaven and he beholds the sons of men. I love that, I love that, uh, that statement in scripture. Because I just picture God who created the world, who created mankind, and he's looking out and he's beholding the sons of men. What do you think he, how do you think he feels when he looks out on this world? Well, you know how you feel when you see the state of the world. Well, how do you think God feels? Well, it's grievous to him. You wonder why he just doesn't end it all like right now. Why does he just stop the whole mess in the human race? Well, I'll tell you the reason why he doesn't do it. Because his hand of grace is extended and he's offering salvation to this world. And the time will come according to his plan when you can either say his patience runs out or his plan is fulfilled and he will end it. But the point I want to make really is when he looks out from his high and holy place and sees the mess that the world is in and the sin of mankind, do you think right now he's taking special delight in seeing you and me here or God's people worshiping throughout the world in small congregations? Absolutely he does. It brings joy to his holy heart. So there is that other side to being pious. It's not all about me. I'm pious. I'm holy. I have piety. I believe in Christian piety. It's not all about me. It's for God to bring joy to him. He delights in this. And don't let it trouble you that there is this other definition, that people will tell you that you're a pious hypocrite, that all Christians are hypocrites and all the rest. That shouldn't bother you at all. You would expect them to say that. So his parents were pious. Secondly, the family had good and happy times together. We, we see this as we read the narrative with sanctified imagination and with some help of some historical studies and comments of scholars who have helped us to see this, that when you read verse 44, that they supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Once again, you're thrust back on the, the study of history and, and the study of this kind of event and where you learn, well, what did, what did these people do in these caravans? It mentions his friends and acquaintances, relatives and acquaintances, 
And this gives us a glimpse into the larger family life and social life of this family. The verse shows us that they travel together to a feast in a caravan, and it appears to be a very large caravan of relatives and acquaintances or friends. When you take verses 44 and 45 together, we can easily see that this was not a small caravan. They had to search through it. The words, they began to search for him, indicate that this was not a simple search because of the number of people who traveled together. Lenski describes the boys in the party traveling in their own company during the day. His commentary on Luke chapter 2, suggesting that in, let's say, one of these, uh, in, in some of these, uh, whatever they were, wagons, I guess you could say, uh, the boys were there together, just enjoying themselves, laughing. Um, and this was accepted. Growing up in his family, Jesus was surrounded by family and friends. And all of these were faithful Israelites when it came to their major obligations to God in Israelite worship. So they had family times together. And this, needless to say, they had, must have had these same family times of joy and happiness in their home in Nazareth. Now, another thing then that you see in this narrative, Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, is the tension that did arise on this one occasion. Luke chapter 2 and verse 48. The tension that did arise. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, son, why have you treated us this way? Notice the language. Why have you treated us this way? It has a, it has a bite to it, doesn't it? Why have you treated us this way? How a parent feels when, when a parent is actually mistreated by a child. Look, or behold, don't you see? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. They're frustrated. They're exasperated. So there is a tension here in the relationship. For his parents, this was not something he had ever done. Imagine that, 12 years, he'd never done anything like this. We can be pretty sure of that. He said, well, how can you be sure of that? Well, he was the sinless son of God. I can't imagine raising a sinless child. But if that means anything, it has to mean that a sinless child never does anything wrong, never rolls back his eyes, never huffs and puffs or anything like that. No, really, sinless. He never sinned. I can't imagine it. And so here you have the, the, this first manifestation of tension. It doesn't last very long, of course. The Lord deals with it in a very wonderful way. And they did affectionately call him son. Son, don't you see how we are right now, anxiously looking for you? But the normal relationship is described in verse 51, or the norm in their relationship. When he went, he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So although there was a brief moment of tension here, once the relief of finding their son flooded their hearts, and they got over their exasperation, expressed it to him, everything just returned again to normal. And this is the kind of family life that our Lord had with his parents and his brothers and sisters. The normal relationship is described in verse 51. Jesus was the model man in his obedience, and he was the model son in his obedience to the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother so that your days will be long upon the earth. This was heaven in the home, a peaceful relationship always with the Lord Jesus. Even though Mary and Joseph had a sinful nature, I could just imagine that his sin, sinlessness must have moderated their own sinful natures to think that they are living with a son who is not a what, what shall we say, an ordinary human being? He was an ordinary human being. So he, they just knew that he, he was consecrated by God to be the Messiah. They did know that. And they were seeing the fruit of it in his youth as he was growing up, right before their eyes. So the explanation of the tension is that in this first manifestation, the explanation of this first manifestation of tension between the Lord and his parents was an expected tension between, you would expect this to happen at some point, to erupt, so to speak, to come out into the 
foreground. It's the tension between the will of God and the will of man. Remember the incident with Peter that our Lord had when he said to Peter, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And that's what's happening here. And it would happen again in Cana of Galilee. Woman, what do I have to do with you? And more severely in the Beelzebub incident recorded in Mark chapter 3, where you remember in Mark chapter 3 and verse 21, that the crowd gathered, they went out to take custody of him. Strong word. They went to take custody of him, saying he has lost his mind. And so apparently at, at that time, as they watched, as Mary watched her son and they watched their brother in this aggressive ministry and crowds so that they couldn't even get near him, they said, he is mad. And they concurred with the judgment of the scribes and the Pharisees who said in Mark 3.22, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by Beelzebub by this false god, this demon god. And then, of course, he told the parable of the strong man, and and then they arrived in Luke, Mark chapter three and verse 31, looking for him. That is, looking to take him, looking to take him away. Our son is mad, we're gonna take him away. And you know the rest of, of that story. So it explains the tension. So that's what we have in, in Luke chapter two. It's very simple, it's short, it's brief. But it it does paint a rather complete picture of home life for the Lord Jesus. Add to that what we know about uh, teaching Jewish children life in the home. There are men that God has gifted over the years, like Alfred Edersheim, who've done a lot of work in this, Jewish studies, and and, uh, and from the Mishnah, uh, you you can get a pretty full account of the age of instruction, the course, the curriculum of instruction, at what age they introduce another subject, biblical subject, and you see that it was a very solid biblical uh, curriculum uh, that the Jewish children were subjected to. So that's the first thing then, is his parents. The second thing then is his development, and this is the biggest part of our consideration tonight, and the most wonderful, I think, of all. The, his development, which is described in verse 40, it's also described in verse 52 at the end. So clearly it's a, it's a bookend. Uh, verse 40, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Book ended in verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And then in, in between you have the incident when he was 12 years old. Now, There are five places in the Bible where you find this statement. Five occasions in the Bible in which God has given to the world his basic psychology of human growth and development. God has given us not a a, a, a manual, not a textbook on psychology, but he has given us in his word a basic psychology of human growth and development, which is to say, the way that human beings should develop. Yes, it's that simple. The way that human beings should develop. It's meant to be a general picture. That's true. It's not, as I said, a manual. But it's the way that human beings should develop. Human beings born in sin, How are they to grow? What should be their major concerns in life? What are they to be seeking after as they grow and develop as human beings in this life? And there they are. The first one was found in Luke chapter one and verse 80 with respect to John the Baptist. So I'll take you through the five right now. The first is in Luke chapter one and verse 80. Notice the similarity of the language with a little variation, very similar. The child continued to grow and become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So in the New Testament, that's the first one. It's John the Baptist. The second one is Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, which you just read. And interestingly, that one, as is true of Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, those two apply to Jesus. Notice, they're the same statements. One applies to a a man who is a sinner, that's John the Baptist. 
and the other applies to a man who is not a sinner. John the Baptist is a sinner. Jesus is not a sinner. He is no sin. He has no sin nature, and he never sins. And yet the same statement is made about him as is made about John the Baptist. Think about that. And what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is that even though Jesus is God, he still is a man, and he grows as a man in the same way that a man grows. In the same areas of development that are the most important and critical for any person who lives in this world. Now, the other two are in the Old Testament, and we'll take these chronologically. The first is Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.26. Several months ago, I started a Wednesday Bible study. We do it on Zoom in the book of 1 Samuel, and we are presently in chapter, chapter 9, and I've been, been enjoying it tremendously. It's a, it's a very detailed study that we have, and uh, so these chapters are fresh in my mind. But in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26, notice the same statement. It's the first one found in the Bible of this nature. 1 Samuel 2.26, now the boy Samuel was growing in stature, which just means size, physical growth. The boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. Stature, size, and favor. Physical growth and favor, socially and favor. Socially, favor with the Lord and with men. Social favor in a relationship, in other words, a relationship with God and a relationship with men. They're, they're in the same verse. So a proper relationship with God, proper relationship with men. How to relate to God. There is a way to relate to God, and there are ways not to relate to God. Just as same as is true with people. There are ways to relate to people that are right. There are ways that are wrong. There are ways to relate to people that are harmful, hurtful, and won't get you anywhere. And there are ways that will help you in your relationship with people. And will accomplish things. And will do good. But there are some that aren't even worth trying, but human beings try them all the time. Kids try them all the time with their parents, and they just don't work. And they really mess things up. But that's, what, that's the subject here. The, same, the other one, the fifth one, which is actually the second in the Bible, is Proverbs 3, verse 4. Proverbs 3 and verse 4. Proverbs 3, chapter we love. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know that verse, right? Sometimes a verse is so familiar to us that we forget to read the context. And so here, in verse 4, it says, So you will find favor and good repute or reputation in the sight of God and man. And then it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. But there is the statement again, there it is again. This wonderful statement that shines like, like the brightest star in the constellation. These five stars shine so brightly. And they're all tied together, they're all saying the same thing. The interesting thing is who they're applied to. So the first one is applied to Samuel. And the contrast there is between Samuel and Eli in his house and the sons of Eli who were worthless men and stole from the people. They were self-centered, gluttons. They didn't care about people. They didn't care about God. They didn't care about the worship. They just took their big old fork and they stuck it in the pot and they just took out the best meat for themselves and just, just chomped it down. They had no regard for God, no regard for man, no favor with God, no favor with man. And the contrast is with Samuel. He was growing in stature and in favor both with God and man. The second one is found in the book of Proverbs. So written during the time of Solomon, obviously, Solomon's Proverbs. And notice here, that verse applies to everybody. 
That verse applies to everybody. That applies, Proverbs 3 applies to the whole human race. It's written to Israel, but it applies to the whole human race. Proverbs 3 and verse 4 is a statement that applies to the human race. This is what human, the human race should seek after, to find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man, to learn how to relate to God, learn how to relate to people. And in that pursuit, everyone who is on that path must trust in the Lord with all his heart and not lean on his own understanding. But acknowledge God and God will make your path straight. So the second one applies to everyone. The third one applies to John the Baptist and the fourth applies to Jesus. So you've got Samuel, you've got the whole human race, Proverbs 3, then you have John the Baptist, and then you have Jesus, two verses for him. Luke 2.40 and Luke 2.52. Now let's talk about the elements of these verses that I've just outlined for you. And the first, we'll talk about Christ's physical growth, his spiritual growth, and then his social growth. So first of all, Christ's physical growth. It's referring to bodily, bodily stature. Lenski says it's referring to his, his, his physical growth, his bodily stature, not his age. It would be obvious to say that he grew in age. So he's talking about Jesus growing strong physically. And we can conclude from this, plus just concluding from our Lord's work, his occupation, working with wood, working with large carts, yokes, heavy wood, and so on, wheels, that our Lord was very strong. He was a strong, impressive, commanding figure. Uh, Lenski says, these pale, anemic Christ ought to be abolished from our imagination. He was not weak. And you see him there overturning the, temp the table of the, in the temple, the tables of the money changers. He is strong. He does this single-handedly. Now, he did not have a supernatural physical growth. Please understand that. He had a normal physical growth. People in antiquity did more with their hands, not having the gadgets that we have, washing machines, dryers, they washed their clothes out by hand, and everything they did, they did with their hands. So they were stronger physically. <clears throat> they did more with their feet not having the means of transportation, except for mules, and they did a lot of walking. And so growing up, Jesus worked with his hands in wood, maybe stone. With his father, Joseph, he would have traveled around the countryside, hiked the hills, delivered products that they had made, and exerted himself in every way necessary in his family. And he did this throughout his life so that he became strong physically. This was a normal growth for him, as it was for anyone living in that time, and for most people in antiquity. In his case, it was also preparation for the three to three and a half years of ministry, which he would be given, which, in which he would have great demands upon himself physically. I love those Bible maps which show the footprints of Jesus. My present Bible doesn't have one of those. And you see his footprints walking throughout the entirety of the land. And he did walk in his life throughout the land. And most notably, the ordeal of the cross revealed that he had reserves of physical strength, not divine strength, but physical strength, which helped him during those six hours to maintain his thought life and express his heart and will both to God and even to his mother, <clears throat> his physical growth. Secondly, Christ's spiritual growth. The statement in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 is much like the two Old Testament passages that I read, the one that applied to Samuel and the one that applies to all people. <clears throat> Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It applies to those two passages, 1 Samuel 26 and Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 4. Favor with God, favor with man. So let's think about these two things for a moment. Think with me now. Favor with God is an indicator of spiritual growth. If you say that you're growing spiritually, if I ask you, are you growing spiritually, and you say, yes, I'm growing spiritually, you have to think about your answer. What, what do you mean? What do you mean you're growing spiritually? Well, what you should understand is that growing spiritually means that you are having more and more favor with God. Some people think they're growing spiritually because they're learning more because they're adding to their stock of knowledge. And that's a good thing, and we need to grow more, and we need to learn more. 
But that's not the precise understanding of favor with God. Favor with God means that God is increasingly more pleased with me because of my growth. Favor with God. God is increasingly pleased with you. That's a powerful application question that we should all ask ourselves. Sometimes in my life, if I'm going through something or some struggle or something, and I ask myself, is God more pleased with me now than he was three months ago? I'd have to say no, because I'm struggling with something. Maybe there's something I'm not taking care of. When he said to his son at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, that's favor with God. The statement is general, but that is the essence of the statement. These statements, 1 Samuel 2, Proverbs 3, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2, these statements are not detailed doctrinal analyses of justification by faith, the relationship between justification and sanctification, or the dynamic of ongoing confession of sin, repentance, and restoration. They don't say anything about that. They just say generally, favor with God. They're not doctrinal statements. They're just general statements that the person who is being discussed, Samuel, John the Baptist, even the Lord Jesus, is pleasing to God. And so it's not the time to get into these doctrinal considerations. We know, we would say, well, you can't be pleasing to God unless you're justified. Absolutely, I agree with that. You can't be pleasing to God unless you're, you're being sanctified. Yes, I agree with that. But that's not what these verses are really talking about. They're just general statements as indicators of spiritual growth. Sure, you have to know why God is pleased with you. And it involves these things. And of course, none of that applied to Jesus. He didn't need to be justified by faith. And he didn't need to be sanctified. Although he did need to be perfected in his sufferings. But notice that the five statements are all the same. They are made equally without any differentiation between a sinful human and the sinless Son of God. There's no difference. It just means that each one was pleasing to God, favor with God. And being fully human yet without sin, he needed to grow spiritually, though he was fully God. We understand that growing up when he was four years old, he didn't know everything that he knew when he was 14 years old. He grew in knowledge. But at every point of his life, he had favor with God, which means God was pleased with him. That's what favor with God means. God was pleased with you. And that's what it means to have favor with men. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Luke chapter 2 and verse 40 gives two added descriptors of this spiritual growth. Spiritual growth, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, notice, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Those are the two things. Spiritual growth means increasing in wisdom, the grace of God being upon you, or I like to look at it this way, because the grace of God is upon you, you increase in wisdom. I think logically that's the connection. Because the grace of God is upon you, you increase in wisdom. You could look at it the other way, increasing in wisdom. I like it the other way. I like it the first way that I just said. Stick with that. Because the grace of God is upon me, you have wisdom. I think Joseph is a great illustration of this. Let me read Genesis 39, verses 2 through 4. Genesis 39, verses 2 through 4. The Lord was with Joseph so that he became a successful man. Now the, his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. He made him overseer over his house and all that he owned he put in his charge. So the grace of God was upon Joseph. He had wisdom and then he had favor with God and with man. In this case, a pretty important man, the Pharaoh. So the grace of God was upon Jesus is the same thing as saying that the Lord was with Joseph. The grace of God was upon Joseph. He was successful, 
which is another way of saying he had wisdom and he also had favor with men. And he, all things were put in his charge. The evidence of the grace of God was his growth in wisdom. <clears throat> uh, turn back to Isaiah chapter 11. We, we looked at that this morning. It's such a pivotal passage there, so critical and so beautiful as well. Isaiah chapter 11, it's worth looking at again. Isaiah 11. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And notice here in the New American Standard, and probably in whatever version you have there before you, the spirit of the Lord in verse 2, first line, is a capital S. It should be if it's not, but it is here. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. This is referring to the, the third person of the Trinity. This is referring to the indwelling, or even you could say the ondwelling or indwelling, of the Holy Spirit on the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. In the next three lines, spirit should be lowercase. It probably is in your Bible. It is in mine. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. So notice, this is very important. When it... When you come to the second line and the third line and the fourth line, it's talking about the human spirit. The human spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit and the human spirit. Now they always go together. But you have to clearly differentiate here. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. What is that spirit? What are, what are the manifestations of the spirit of the Lord resting on a man? And what will be the manifestation of the Spirit resting on you? Because we believe that God has given us his Holy Spirit. And that the Spirit of God has been poured out in our hearts. Romans 5, 5. We have the Holy Spirit when we have Christ. We've been baptized into the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit transforms our spirits. Small s, the human spirit. And so the Spirit, the small s, the Spirit of the Messiah, of Jesus, will be a spirit, a worldview, a perspective, a lifestyle of wisdom and understanding, counsel and strength, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness, and so on. So, Favor with God means increasing in wisdom. The grace of God, the grace of God upon you is the same as saying the spirit of God is upon you. You know, the Pharaoh, well, he's an idol worshiper. He worships the Egyptian gods of the sun and the moon. The same with, the, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, with Daniel. The, both of those leaders said, there's a divine spirit in these men. There's a divine spirit in Joseph. There's a divine spirit in Daniel. Well, they were right. They had the wrong spirit in mind, but they were right. There was a spirit in these men of God, Joseph and Daniel, and they were successful. They had wisdom. They were leaders. They were men of conviction. And the Pharaoh and the king used them to their advantage. They were successful. And that's what these verses are talking about, these five verses, spiritual growth, increasing in wisdom, the grace of God is upon you. The grace of God is the same as the spirit of God. The spirit of grace, he's called in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. The spirit of grace, the spirit of God. The spirit of God is in you. The spirit of grace is upon you. Wisdom flows from you. You increase in wisdom. As you grow physically, you increase in wisdom. It's beautiful. And the Messiah is this person par excellence. Now let's talk about his social growth. Physical growth, spiritual growth, social growth. He grew in favor with man. This means two things. First of all, to grow in social growth means you know, you learn how to relate to other people. You know, in life, these are two pretty big tasks. 
for people in general. And if we can communicate to this to our young ones or when, they're, when they're young, when they're teaching them in the Christian home, and as we can communicate this to people as part of our evangelism, hey, you need to learn how to relate to God. Have you ever thought about relating to God? Have you ever thought about the favor of God? And you know, you use that as an introduction to bring them the gospel. But this business of relating to other people, of course the world is a mess when it comes to this whole point, but growing in favor and stature with God and man, as these five critical verses tell us, involves learning how to relate to other people. It's simply referring to social development or learning how to relate to other people. It is not saying that every person who develops God's way has the same kind of personality or temperament. It is not a denial of big differences among people, differences in personality, ways of communicating. It's not denying any of that. It's not saying that all young people will be outgoing extroverts or people people because they relate to other people well. It's not saying anything like that. It doesn't mean that a young person cannot be reserved or that there is something wrong with being shy or anything like that. It has nothing to do with anything that I have just described. <clears throat> Social development, God's way, means specifically relating to people and kindness. <clears throat> relating to people with kindness toward other people is a general pattern of relationships, kindness. And that's why you have in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22, in the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, what are they? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Kindness, social development, God's way is seen in showing kindness and being gracious toward other people as a general pattern of relationships. Yes, it's God's will that people be kind to one another. <clears throat> So if you're here this evening and you haven't been kind to people in your life today, that's something you really need to deal with. And if it's becoming a pattern in your life, you need to deal with that. Because all that you want yourself to be, my friend, you will not realize it with treating people that way. And since one of the five human development passage is, is in Proverbs 3. It hints to us that the entire book of Proverbs will help us to understand some of the most important dynamics of relating to other people. You have a whole book in the Bible that talks about this subject, social development, relating to other people. Let me just give you a few examples. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, right in that context. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Notice in the earlier verses, the way to find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man is to be kind. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find this. That's how you find it by being kind, and it applies specifically to favor with man. Proverbs chapter three and verse 27, do not withhold good from whom it is due. Simple principle, do not withhold good from whom it is due. There's something good you need to do to someone, some honor you need to give to someone, some help you need to give to someone, someone close to you, someone in your family, someone in need. That's kindness to do it. And that's how you find favor with man. It has nothing to do with earning anything. It has nothing to do with earning points. It has nothing to do with coming up with more points. And it just has to do with love for people, people just like you. You want people to be kind to you, you be kind to them. Uh, or we could take uh, Proverbs 3.29, do not devise harm against your neighbor. Or uh, Proverbs 14 and verse five, a truthful witness saves lives we're told to tell the truth about other people, not malign their character. So Proverbs is a treasury for social development. And the point is that Jesus learned how to relate to other people. And if he had to learn how to relate to other people, how much more do we have to learn that? So secondly, it, it also means, the first thing was to show kindness to other people, but it also means that Jesus observed people as he was growing up so that he could be a giving person, a person who blessed other people, who was not a self-centered man. 
He observed people. If you, if you love people, and especially if you love the people around you, people in your life, the people that you deal with every day, family members, people that you, you see regularly, people that you see at church, if you, if you have love in your heart, you will, you will try to learn about those people so that you can be a blessing to them. You don't want to be a, 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 a brute, a boor. Just be who you are and act as though you act, act, act the way you act and take pride in that. This is the way I am. You don't want to be that kind of a person, do you? You want to be a blessing to other people. If there's something I need to change so I can relate better to another person, I, I, I want to do that. And uh, if someone tells me, I'll work on it. If they don't tell me, I'm not going to assume there's nothing wrong. I'm going to look at my own character and my behavior and ask, is there some way I could bless this person a little better, a little more than I'm doing? Jesus observed people as he was growing up. That was something we talked about this morning, growing up in Nazareth. And he wasn't often some, behind some curtain. He wasn't a monastic. He was with people. He observed people. Link it to favor with God. Link the two together. We learn more about God so that we can have his favor. We can be pleasing to him. If we want more knowledge, just so we can say we know more or demonstrate our knowledge, our great learning, that would not be a good thing. But why do we want to know more about God? Well, we want to have his favor. We want him to be pleased with us. So why do we learn, want to learn more about people? People generally, that's a big task. But people specifically, the people who, who you live with, the people who are around you, the people who are part of your life, why do we want to learn more about them and their situations and their needs? Well, so we can be a blessing to them and have favor. We're not trying to earn anything with them. We're not, we're not looking for honors and praises. We just want to be a blessing to them. And we don't want to have a relationship in which They'd rather not see us, or they're irritated with us, or they're irked, or they're frustrated. We don't want that. Do you want to frustrate people? Do you want to make them unhappy? Do you want to make them sad? Do you want to make them say, oh, here she comes. I'm going the other way. Oh, here he comes. I don't want to get involved with that kind of conversation again. Do you want that to happen? No. You want to have favor in that sense. You want things to go smoothly with people. We teach our children how to overcome obstacles so that they may Arise in that may arise in relationships so that we do not just give up on relationships. A child will say, I'm just going to give up on my brother. I'm just going to give up on my little sister. And adults do that as well. I'm just going to give up on my parents. I'm just going to give up on my mom. I'm just going to give up on my dad. I've had enough of that. I'm going to give up on this person. I'm going to give up on this relationship. It's too hard. And you don't want to be that way. Favor with God and man. It's not easy, but God gives you the grace to do it. And it's what Jesus did. Think of how difficult it was for the Lord Jesus in his ministry to deal with people. But he did it with the grace of God. And he bore with people. He said things like, how long shall I put up with you? On echo, bear up under the load of this. Don't you remember? Don't you remember the incident of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 and all that you had left of Don't you remember? It was hard for him, but he did it, and he left us an example. This area of social growth is one of the things that, which made him so successful with people throughout his ministry. Even though many hated him, and the leadership of Israel was set against him, to wanted to crucify him, that had nothing to do with his excellent growth in dealing with people. We see it in the temple incident. This conjunction of favor with God and favor with man. He was in his father's house listening and asking questions, and they were amazed. And then he dealt with his parents in a loving, gracious way. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But I'm going to go now, and I'm going to continue in subjection to you. He didn't make a big issue out of it, nor did they. The whole thing went very smoothly. Because Jesus was growing in favor and stature with God and man. So now let's uh, close with some points of application. Let me just say, uh, I'm gonna talk about three things that Jesus is the pattern for family life. Jesus is the pattern for raising children. 
and then Jesus is the pattern for our, our own personal growth and development. So real quickly here, Jesus is the pattern for family life. Family life. Family piety, let's talk about. Family piety, which just simply means, in the most basic way, a reverence and respect for God and religious obligations. Even in a household where not all of the dwellers in that household know the Lord or are saved and saved, we should still strive to cultivate in those families. We raised children. Not all of our children were Christians as we were raising them. But you can, despite that, as parents, seek to cultivate a family piety that is not overbearing, irksome, and you know, kind of a jam it down your throat piety. You want to be careful of that. Excessively righteous. But a family piety in which we just teach our children, whether they're, they know the Lord or not, to respect God, religious obligations, and have an atmosphere in the home that is pious. And a lot will depend on you as parents. Sometimes parents make a lot of mistakes in this area. And you just have to evaluate your own home and ask yourself some serious questions about this. Secondly, family worship. There should be time for worship, prayer, learning the word in the home. And if you, you have children you're raising and they're not uh, inclined to those times, you have to really pray and work hard to make them as pleasing as possible. They may have to be shorter for that reason. You have to do whatever needs to be done to cultivate in your family some worship. And thirdly, family happiness, joy. Illustrated in the early church, I, I was thinking of this passage just this afternoon, Acts chapter 2. Please turn there. It's a passage, a description about the church, but think of, apply it to family life. Family life. Acts chapter 2, 45 through 47. <clears throat> Acts 2, 45 through 47. Uh, 46 through 47. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So that's where I want to start. Gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor. There is that word again. There's that word again, favor having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. There it is again, favor with God and man. Favor with God, he was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Favor with people, why? Because they were, they were loving them and providing for people's needs, and they were glad and sincere in heart and happy, praising God. It's a beautiful picture. And that's what I'm talking about here. When I talk about a pattern for family life, the household of Jesus is that pattern for us because it talks about family piety, a spirit in the home, family worship, activities which honor God, and family happiness and joy, which is illustrated in the early church, giving thanks for all of God's good gifts. So a pattern for family life, briefly. Secondly, a pattern for raising children. And here... You have three elements, knowledge, application, and grace, or kindness. You have scripture instruction, which is always the basis of our knowledge of God. It's in the scripture. We teach our children the scripture. We share scripture. My wife and I, at our age, every day, we read the Bible together, and so we're sharing. And I'll ask her questions, she'll ask me questions, and we're still sharing, we're still learning, we're still growing. The children are all gone, they're all married but we're still doing this scripture instruction because we view ourselves as a husband and wife who are still growing spiritually. And the Bible is still the basis for that. Scriptural instruction, wisdom impartation, or the application of scripture to the specific situations of life. Scripture application. How do I apply the worldview of the Bible to my specific problems and situations and pressures and stresses and relationship issues that are coming up? And let me, let me just again encourage young people 
teenagers especially, you know, okay, you, you may not be a Christian, you, you're not professing Christ right now, but still, you still have a heart of love, I'm sure. Think of wise ways to communicate things to your parents if there's something in your heart, something troubling, troubling you. Seek for wisdom. So you have scripture instruction, wisdom impartation, and social interaction. Social interaction. Grace and kindness. Isn't it something that in the world, people who don't know God, they may be of different types of religions, they can be some of the kindest people. Gracious, common grace. Talk about common grace, common grace, kindness. Well, you expect that. In this world, you'll find a lot of kind people, loving people, benevolent people, who don't even profess Christ. So it's not just that all Christians, they're Christians are the only people who do these things. No, of course not. But it's especially sad when Christian people don't do these things. That's a very shameful thing. And so even in social interaction in the church, it's a grievous thing. It's a grievous to us. And it must be increasingly or more grievous to God when his own people don't know how to relate to each other in the household of God and treat one another unfairly, unkindly, without grace. So a pattern for raising children, and I got a little bit ahead of myself, a pattern for personal growth and development. Physical stewardship, the stewardship of our bodies, you all know Pastor Martin wrote a book on that. The stewardship of our bodies, good health, exercise, spiritual stewardship, the grace of God in my life, the spirit of God, wisdom for life, and social stewardship, the stewardship of my relationships. Prayerfully coming to the Lord for grace, to ask the Lord to help you to strengthen your relationships with other people. Lord, thank you so much for the youth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Jesus the Nazarene, for his family life, for his upbringing, for the, the Jewish home in which he was reared, for uh, the, these great five passages of biblical psychology, which we see applied to Samuel, to John the Baptist, to Jesus, and then to all people in that most beloved passage, Proverbs chapter three. Lord, give us a vision for our lives, a vision that will incorporate this work of the Spirit, Isaiah chapter 11, the Spirit of the Lord resting even upon us, the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge, the spirit of counsel and strength and understanding and the fear of the Lord. Lord, fill our human spirits with the spirit of God and all the fruit of the spirit described there in Galatians chapter five, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Lord, fill us with these fruits of the spirit. We know that without salvation, we cannot ultimately have, we cannot have, and we cannot ultimately know these things in the fullest form. We realize that by common grace, we may have and offer some of these things in our lives, but Lord, we want also to please you. It's not just that we want to please other people and help other people. We want to have favor with God. We want you to be pleased with us. And you are most pleased with us when we trust in your son and find our justification in him the forgiveness of our sins, and also by a life and a lifestyle of kindness. So please, Lord, be with us in, in the week ahead. And fill us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.